thank you all for joining us today as we partner with New York Presbyterian Wheel Cornell for our gynecological Mythbusters workshop. We are very excited to have gynecologic oncologist and assistant professor at Wheel Cornell, Dr. Cantillo, and gynecologic surgeon and Director of Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery, Dr. Shin, here with us today to discuss common myths surrounding various women's health topics. It is important to note that this workshop is intended for educational purposes. So although we do have doctors speaking, we are not allowed to elicit medical advice at this time. Okay, so I think we're gonna get started. So Dr. Shin, um, I'm sure, I, I mean, we all see a lot of patients like multiple times a week and are kind of dealing with different um, things that they may come in saying that they've read on the internet or that they've been told by friends. Um, how often have you had a patient tell you that endometriosis is always painful? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Contillo. You're right. I do have a lot of patients who self-refer after seeing Dr. Google, and um, endometriosis is definitely still an enigmatic disease that um, does affect a significant portion of women in the reproductive years and can have some serious consequences. So it's really important to be aware of the signs and symptoms and try to get an expedited diagnosis. Um, the symptoms for endometriosis really vary uh, patient to patient. Um, you may be completely asymptomatic. And other times, a patient may experience significant pain um, that can be worse with their periods or maybe not. It can be continuous pain. Whenever you have pain from a chronic condition, it can go from uh, being exacerbated um, during your periods to something more chronic. Um, and if you're at the point of needing to seek help because Motrin isn't cutting it, Tylenol isn't cutting it, that isn't normal. It's not normal to have such painful periods. So that should be an early warning sign that um, uh, you go in to see your gynecologist and advocate for yourself and discuss the other symptoms you might be having, like bleeding in addition to pain, um, to try to get to the right diagnosis early. Great. Um, speaking of endometriosis and uh, in your specialty line of work uh, in GYN malignancies, um, is there a risk of ovarian cancer in patients with endometriosis? Yeah, that's a really good question and a question that comes up often. Um, so just to kind of take a step back, ovarian cancer, it's not just one disease, it's actually several different types of ovarian cancers exist. They come from different parts of the ovary. They're from the parts that make the eggs, the inside portion of the ovary that does not have the, um, the egg in it, and then the actual surface portion of the ovary. And the one that most, most people are familiar with are the surface um, ovarian cancers. And in particular, high-grade serous cancers are the ones that are most commonly diagnosed. With that said, there does appear to be an increased risk of ovarian cancer. Um, these do come from the surface, but they are not high-grade serous. They're actually um, endometrioid and clear cell types. And what that really means is that once the pathologists or the doctors that look at everything under a microscope take a look at these cells, they tell us what they think this looks like. And there are a lot of different things that they could be. So with regards to an endometriosis associated ovarian cancer, we know in particular endometrioid and clear cell types are the ones that have an increased risk. This risk is usually seen for women that have ovarian endometriosis, but not for patients that have endometriosis in like deep infiltrating in other places like the rectum or the bladder, or like wherever else uh, endometrios endometriosis can appear. It really looks like it's primarily for those patients that have it in the ovary. So as I just alluded to, it seems like um, endometriosis can occur in 
different places? Can it just occur in reproductive organs? Yes, great question. Um, just to add to what you were saying, um, um, endometriosis definitely can impact the ovaries. And when that happens, it's called an endometrioma. Um, and would you say that the risk of cancer from endometriosis of the ovaries is rare? It's really rare. The risk of like an endometriosis kind of transforming itself to something malignant or cancerous has been estimated to be about 1% for premenopausal women and about one to two percent for postmenopausal women, so still pretty rare. Okay. Yes, I think that's important to keep in mind for our patients because endometriomas are relatively common in reproductive age women who do have endometriosis, um, and so uh, it is important to first see a gynecologist to get it um, evaluated and and have whatever imaging is necessary to have it deeper look into what's actually going on in your ovaries. But aside from your ovaries, endometriosis really can happen anywhere in the pelvis and abdomen. Most common areas, of course, are around your uterus, um, in an area called the posterior cul-de-sac, which is behind the uterus, around your tubes and your ovaries. But you can also have endometriosis on your bowel, on your bladder, leading to symptoms that you think might not be associated with your periods. So you may have what um, are called irritable bowel syndromes of chronic um, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, um, or um, symptomatic urinary um, uh, sensations that are painful. Um, and also you can have it along your diaphragm. There have been cases of endometriosis being found in the lungs as well. Yeah, it seems, I mean, obviously from treating patients like this in the past, it can be pretty painful. I have had um, some patients that I've seen think that hysterectomy is the only cure for endometriosis. What do you think about that? Well, the first thing I would say is that there is no cure for endometriosis. And although that might sound disheartening, that doesn't mean you're not going to have significant symptom relief so you could have a much more positive quality of life. Um, there are multiple treatment options for endometriosis um, and surgery is the most risky, right? So we don't go into it without having considered other options. Um, so some of the more conservative treatment options include um, NSAIDs, Motrin, Advil, ibuprofen, whatnot with Tylenol and see if your symptoms can be controlled like that. And if not, then hormonal therapies such as an IUD or birth control pills with estrogen or uh, hormonal therapies that are progesterone only can be um, very helpful. And after three or four months of trying these medications, if you're not getting adequate relief, then definitely speak to your um, doctor about a possible diagnostic laparoscopy, because that's truly the only way to definitively diagnose endometriosis. And resecting the endometriosis might be all that you need. Um, and certainly if the pain does come back and, and you want to think of more, I don't want to say definitive, but um, uh, more um, uh, surgical treatment options, then hysterectomy can certainly be one of those options. But even after hysterectomy, unfortunately, a small percentage of women can have recurrence or persistence of pain. Um, speaking of risk factors for ovarian cancer, um, can you um, describe some other risk factors and also specifically um, touch upon what it means to be BRCA positive and how it impacts your risk for ovarian cancer? Sure. Yeah. Great question. So um, there are risk factors for ovarian cancer. Um, among them are um, older age, we know that the average age of diagnosis is 62. Um, doesn't mean that you can't get it when you're younger. However, older age is a risk factor. Um, women that started menstruating early, so less than 10 years old or have late menopause older than 52 years of age, um, are also considered um, to have like a risk factor. Um, women who have not had any um, biological children, that's also considered a risk factor. Uh, asbestos exposure, a history of pelvic radiation, 
as well as genetic factors are considered risk factors. And I left the genetic factors uh, for the end to kind of segue into your next question, um, which is about um, the BRCA um, mutation. So um, BRCA slash BRCA, one and two, AKA Angelina Jolie had that whole like Time Magazine uh, article. And I think that really put, um, put it on the map but it is one of the many hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndromes that we are aware of and probably the most, the most well-known, the most common. So there are actually two BRCA mutations, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, the BRCA1 mutation, actually, actually both BRCA1 and 2 um, place women at about a 65 to 80% risk of developing breast cancer. Um, in addition, a BRCA1 gene mutation is associated with upwards of a 40% risk of developing ovarian cancer. This is like a lifetime risk, whereas a BRCA2 mutation, while it's lower, it's still upwards of 20%. And to put that in context, the population risk is about 2, like 1.8% actually. So we're talking like magnitudes over um, what population risk is. Um, in addition, just because I think people think BRCA, BRCA, and they think just breast and ovary. Um, for patients with a BRCA2 mutation, not only is this associated with the increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer, there's also an increased risk of pancreatic, um, prostate, and um, certain skin cancers, in particular melanomas. And I think as we're getting more information about this genetic landscape, we're going to be finding kind of more things that that um, maybe have increased risk given this, um, these mutations? So it's a great question. Um, is endometriosis hereditary? Absolutely. Um, so we don't fully understand what causes endometriosis and why some women with endometriosis can be completely asymptomatic. And um, some women with an, a, a tiny bit of endometriosis can have severe pain. So the pathophysiology behind the disease is quite complex and still a lot to figure out. But what we do know is that there is definitely a hereditary component where if you have an immediate family member with endometriosis, your risk for getting the disease can be up to seven times that of someone who doesn't. Great. I have to ask you, going back to the risk factors for sure. ovarian cancer, does talcum powder cause ovarian cancer or not? <laughs> that is a really, really good question. Uh, yes, um, the debate will continue, I think, even after my answer. But um, so really, there's no conclusive data to support this. Um, there, the study, so the types of studies that were used to show an increased risk of ovarian cancer um, associated with talcum powder use are based off of what we call case control studies. And um, unfortunately, these are really subject to what we call recall bias. What this means is that you have a group of patients or like a group of people who do have ovarian cancer, like you have both have ovarian cancer and the other group does not. Well, the people that do have the disease that you're looking to study might start remembering these things if they're questioned about it. They might say, oh, I did use talcum powder. And so that's probably not the best study design to really answer this question. I think it makes it interesting. I think it's thought provoking, but I, that by itself is not the best design that we can use. Um, there were other studies that were not these case control studies that actually did not find this association. Um, additionally, and what is kind of thought is that the older versions of talcum powder probably were contaminated with asbestos because asbestos was like pretty ubiquitous in a lot of different things before um, it was recognized as a carcinogen. So we're not sure if we're picking up on just like talc contaminated with asbestos versus an actual association with talcum powder. With that said, the FDA states that there's no conclusive um, link between talc and ovarian cancer, but then there's another agency that has basically um, assigned talc as a possible carcinogen. So you can kind of take, take all, all of that with a, with a grain of salt. I think it is controversial, but the data hasn't necessarily borne that out yet. Thanks for clarifying. 
I hope I clarified. Not sure if I clarified, but I hope that helped. <laughs> um, so now, you know, as gynecologists, I know we we both see lots of ovarian cysts. Ovarian cysts are like very, very common. Um, but have you ever had a patient come to the office and say, I have ovarian cysts and question whether that was PCOS? Yes, absolutely. PCOS, it's polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, and although the word cystic is in there, it doesn't necessarily mean you have cysts. Um, what happens with PCOS, which is a hormonally driven condition where there's a hormonal imbalance by the types of hormones that the ovary is secreting, is that you can develop multiple small follicles. Um, these are uh, fluid-filled sacs that carry immature eggs. And what happens because of a dysregulation of the hormones, you don't ovulate regularly. And so the eggs don't drop and then you can't get a period. Um, but some of the other signs and symptoms of PCOS, um, which would um, uh, elicit a visit to the gynecologist is heavy bleeding, irregular bleeding, prolonged bleeding, and also signs of androgenism. So androgens are um, male hormones that can be produced in excess in women with PCOS. And this can lead to slightly more facial hair than you would like, um, adult onset acne from oilier skin, so if you have a combination of these things, definitely, um, again, advocate for yourself and discuss these issues with your doctor because there are treatments available. I wanted to shift gears a little bit now from ovarian cancer to cervical abnormalities and potential malignancies. Um, and a lot of these questions are surrounding pap smears. Um, so what exactly? Exactly, does a pap smear test for? Does it test for all gynecological cancers or is it one particular cancer? Yeah, that is a great question because unfortunately I see a lot of women who maybe have a diagnosis of a cancer of the uterus or a ovarian cancer and they say, but I just went to my gynecologist a few months ago and my pap smear was normal. So why did this happen? Um, and so it's important to understand that the pap smear is a screening test for cervical cancer. A screening test is just a test that tells us whether there's something abnormal that we should work up more or whether everything is normal and we can kind of go to our, what we call our routine guidelines. So even though if you look at a picture, the uterus and the cervix look like just one, <laughs> one continuous thing, um, and they really are, for us as gynecologists, they are two separate organs. We treat them differently. The cervix, which is that bottom part of the uterus is kind of a separate organ for us um, versus the, the womb or the uterus itself. Um, so when we are doing pap smears, we are just screening for cervical cancer, not endometrial, not ovarian. That's so important to know. Um, and how often should you be getting pap smears? Yes. So depending on who you read. Now we, I, we're gynecologists, so we're gonna follow our um, ACOG, which is our um, kind of national college of obstetrics and gynecology. So the recommendation from ACOG is to start pap smears at the age of 21. Uh, and if you have like a lifetime history of completely normal pap smears, HPV have been negative, you've not had any like abnormalities, then 65 is the recommended age to stop screening. Uh, within there, obviously, there are lots of pathways that can occur if you have abnormal pap smears, because that kind of changes your kind of follow up afterwards. But for a patient that has, for someone who has had absolutely normal pap smears, uh, 21 to 29, you could do a pap smear every three years, just a pap smear without HPV. Starting at age 30, if you do pap smear, and that's normal, and then you have an HPV, which is also negative, normal, no HPV detected, um, those guidelines actually say that you can be screened every five years, as long as you're doing those two tests together. If for some reason you're in a place where HPV cannot be done, or um, 
cannot be ordered. Um, you know, this is a large country. There are a lot of different uh, places that have less access to certain testing than a pap smear by itself without HPV can be performed every three years, um, as long as that is normal. So that is very like broad because obviously as things start becoming abnormal, then that follow-up changes. Okay. So would you say that say, for example, a patient who comes to see me for fibroids, it's also important to assess, you know, her general overall gynecological health and whether she's completed all her screening, including pap smear testing. Absolutely. I think um, we should always, you know, I think it's easy to become focused on one thing that we're working on. So it's fibroids and I could be bleeding and pain. And then sometimes we kind of forget all of the other things. So just evaluating the cervix is always, um, it's a easy thing. It is a highly successful screening program, probably the most successful screening programs we've had in medicine. Um, so I'm obviously a fan. Um, but actually, since you brought up fibroids, I think we could start talking about this because it's it affects so many women. Um, you know, what, what would you say would be the typical management for fibroids. So I think a lot of women think that they need a hysterectomy. Okay, yeah, important question, especially because this is a condition that can affect up to 70 to 80% of women. That's a pretty big population of patients, right? Um, and interestingly, less than 50% of women who have fibroids are actually symptomatic. So one treatment is to do nothing because you don't need anything, right? So if you have um, mild symptoms or no symptoms, um, then this is something you can follow up with your gynecologist and observe, um, maybe get a baseline ultrasound so that the following year you could progress, um, monitor its potential growth. Um, typically, patients who are symptomatic with fibroids present with abnormal bleeding. So heavy bleeding, irregular bleeding, um, spotting in between periods. And you can also experience what we call bulk symptoms, which is because there's a growing mass, benign growing mass inside of you. You can feel that pressure of that mass in and around your pelvis. So you might have lower back pain. You could have almost sciatica-like pain um, shooting down the back of your legs, or the fiber could be sitting right on top of your bladder. So um, frequent urination is something that we see pretty commonly as well. Um, and then depending on the symptoms, the treatments are different. Sometimes if it's just bleeding and the fiber is not very large, um, then you can control um, these symptoms with hormonal therapies. Or if they become more bothersome or are in a location where medical management is unlikely to be all that helpful, for example, if a fiber is within the endometrial cavity, you might need a minor procedure such as a, a, a hysteroscopic resection, which is an outpatient uh, procedure that can be done relatively quickly. You're in recovery for an hour, and then you could go about your day as if you didn't have this done the very next day. Um, but sometimes you do need bigger treatments and surgeries, and this includes a myomectomy, which is removing the fibroid itself, um, or a hysterectomy. At Wild Cornell, we really try to do minimally invasive surgery for these patients um, as often as possible, because as we know, um, the benefits of doing a minimally invasive versus an open abdominal procedure um, are pretty great. Um, and so we're talking about recovering within two weeks versus six to eight weeks. Yeah, and I think it's important that you bring, you brought up the evaluation of um heavy bleeding or abnormal uterine bleeding, because um, I think this is where we, oh, like we definitely overlap here, um, abnormal uterine bleeding. And that can mean a lot of different things. Some women will either have like normal periods, but then have bleeding in between periods. So like intermenstrual spotting. So maybe they'll like have their normal cycle. And then two weeks later, have some bleeding in between. That's not really normal. Or have bleeding that lasts for just weeks at a time. That is also not normal. Um, having regular, like normal flow periods, but like every two weeks bleeding down to a point where you might need a blood transfusion. All of these things kind of fall under that spectrum of abnormal uterine bleeding. And, you know, for those patients, 
I, I think Dr. Shin and I both agree that we would do some type of um, biopsy of the lining of the uterus to ensure that there's nothing more, you know, there, that there's nothing more dangerous going on inside of that lining, just to, to ensure ourselves that there's no like precancerous cells or cancerous cells. Right, really important points. Um, and certainly any woman um, over the age of 45 who has any kind of abnormal bleeding should um, definitely get an endometrial biopsy. Um, do you get bleeding with cervical cancer or is this something you only see with uterine cancer? Yep. Yes. Um, so great question. You can get bleeding with cervical cancer. Uh, the type of bleeding that usually occurs, well, it really does depend on the size. So cervical cancer tends to be something that we can see because the cervix is like really the only part of our reproductive organs that we can see on an exam um, kind of looks like a donut because we always relate everything back to food. Um, but as we start seeing um, perhaps a cervical cancer that is growing from the um, on the actual cervix, we can visibly see these cancers a lot of the time. And as it grows, it can result in just bleeding that has no timing. It is not related to a cycle whatsoever. It can start, it can stop. Um, postcoital bleeding, which means bleeding after intercourse is also like a, that is not normal. Um, and something that if it's happening, you should have that evaluated because really, um, you shouldn't really be having um, bleeding after intercourse. It can happen. However, you should just evaluate that. Um, you can also have kind of this watery blood tinge discharge, which with which goes along with just like the, the tumor itself kind of secreting fluid. And it is friable, which means that it's like constantly shedding. So it can spot, it can bleed, it can be heavy, it can be light. It's really kind of all over the place. Um, but to your point, cancer of the cervix, as well as cancer of the uterus can be associated with um, this abnormal bleeding. Uh, uterine cancer is I would say typically postmenopausal bleeding, like you are postmenopausal, haven't had a period in like over a year, which is a definition of menopause. And then for some reason you start bleeding again. That is not normal either um, and needs to be evaluated. Okay, good to know. Um, now, if someone gets an HPV vaccine, does that mean it's impossible for them to get HPV or cervical cancer? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, I think on the other side of a, a COVID pandemic, we are all unfortunately much more familiar with vaccines than we probably ever wanted to be. Uh, so probably would not be surprised if I tell you that uh, getting vaccinated against HPV does not guarantee, it's like not 100% a guarantee that you will not get HPV. And this for a few reasons. So the HPV vaccine we have in the United States has, um, it's what we call non-avalent. So it has nine um, high risk HPV strains in it. Uh, we know that the high risk HPV strains are the ones that cause cervical cancer and really are primarily responsible for cervical cancer. Not all of them, but like over 90, 95% of cervix cancers are caused by high risk HPV. While the vaccine protects against nine of these, which are responsible for 90% of these cervical cancers, there's still like a 10% um, of HPVs that are not really covered. There is just, there are so many HPV strains. Um, additionally, there are just some people who are not going to get the immune response against one of the HPVs that they were vaccinated against. However, um, with that said, we do have like really great data from these large population studies that have showed that for, you know, um, adolescents who received their HPV vaccination before they were sexually active, when they were not exposed to any HPV, um, the efficacy was somewhere in like the 95 to 97% range. So we're seeing really dramatic decreases in the rates of development of precancerous cells of the cervix and actual cancer. Okay. 
So it's important to get the vaccine and speak to your gynecologist about getting it if you haven't done so. Definitely. And if you have children, nieces, friends that have children, I like strongly recommend grandchildren, anything, I would strongly recommend really the, the recommendation is to vaccinate um, at the ages of 11 and 12. Thank to you provide the best, the best protection. Um, to switch gears, because I, I, I kind of love talking about fibroids because it's so mm -hmm. ubiquitous. Um, and I know a lot of what you do. Uh, is it true that you can't get pregnant if you have fibroids? So fibroids come in all shapes, sizes, locations, textures, um, you know, your ability to get pregnant depends on so many factors. Um, and absolutely, you can get pregnant with fibroids, but there are certain fibroids that you should consider removing before thinking about transferring that embryo or trying to conceive. Um, I mentioned earlier that fibroids that are within your endometrial cavity um, should be resected prior to planning a pregnancy, um, and that this is performed by a minor procedure called a hysteroscopy. Um, just because these types of fibroids can um, uh, cause irregular bleeding may interfere with proper implantation. And then there are other types of fibroids. If they're so large, they're occupying the space where a baby needs to occupy, right? So there sometimes it is in room for both. So it, it then becomes um, important to uh, speak with a GYN surgeon about removing the fibroid again prior to trying to conceive. Now, with that said, plenty of women um, have um, had successful pregnancies with known fibroids, but anything that can be seen on an ultrasound or an MRI that impacts the endometrial cavity, again, the portion of the uterus where a baby would grow, uh, this warrants a further discussion with your gynecologist about whether or not you should have it removed. Great. And can you um, perhaps speak a little bit about uh, myomectomies? Because I know you've talked about the hysteroscopic resections, but um, what if it's not in the cavity in the uterus? Yes. So myomectomies is, well, first of all, the word myoma is just a another term for fibroids. It's exactly the same thing, just different ways to say it. So a myomectomy is removal of the myoma of the fibroid. And I typically do this by a minimally invasive approach, which is when you use, um, make tiny little incisions and use um, these very long, narrow, thin instruments. Um, and what we do is we um, make an incision along your uterus and shell out the fibroid. It's almost like shelling out a, a lychee nut, again, to make a food <laughs> analogy. Um, it kind of almost looks like it. You know, when you get the fibroid um, on in the right plane, uh, as we say, um, it shells out like this very shiny, white, curly appearing mass. Um, and once that mass is removed, there's a defect to repair. So we suture that defect up in layers and uh, our patients go on to uh, attempt pregnancies soon thereafter. Typically, we advise to wait anywhere between three months to six months just to make sure there are no complications with the surgery. And depending on how the incision was made and how deep into the muscle of the uterus we had to go, um, uh, our patients may require cesarean sections in the future. Yeah. Um, my final question to you, and I guess our time is winding down. Um, I often get the question about fibroids and whether or not this is cancer. And I typically tell the patients that fibroids are benign tumor, but there is something else called leiomyosarcoma, um, which is not a benign tumor, but mimics um, fibroids in appearance. What are some signs and symptoms for women with this malignancy? And um, what are some of the treatment options? Yeah, it's a great question. I 
it's a little like it's not as straightforward um there is the like the old teaching which was if you have a very quickly growing uh, myoma or fibroid, then that was suggestive of an aggressive cancer. Lyomyosarcoma is like an aggressive um, cancer that can occur in the muscle of the uterus because the uterus is a muscle. So um, for the most part, um, however, they've kind of looked at this date, this data, and have found that that is not necessarily true. That fast growing myomas don't necessarily mean that there is a, an aggressive cancer there. Um, there are also, I will say, limitations to imaging. So we may have an ultrasound, we'll get an MRI. We are, our imaging is becoming a lot better. However, there is nothing that's 100% diagnostic on a, an MRI or an ultrasound that's going to tell you this is definitely like a lyomyosarcoma. Um, however, you know, there are things that our radiologists can communicate to us that make us more or less concerned about something. So, uh, you know, fibroids or lyomyomas are benign. So they, by definition, even if they grow and they grow really big, they still respect planes. They respect tissue planes, uh, which means that they don't start invading. They don't kind of have invasive features on imaging. So I think once we start seeing that on MRI in particular, I think that's where MRI is particularly helpful, then that makes me think perhaps there's something there. It might not be a lyomyosarcoma, but there are other types of sarcomas that can exist. Um, there are some pre- malignant lesions that are that also can exist. And so that kind of raises my spidey senses to a certain extent. Um, the other thing is I do not trust growing fibroids in postmenopausal women. I think if you're postmenopausal, they should be inactive. They're either are the same size, they don't get bigger, they might get smaller, but they should not get bigger. So once I start seeing growing fibroids in your postmenopausal, to me, that's indication enough to surgically remove. Um, and, you know, for a lyomyosarcoma, which is the most aggressive form of um, a sarcoma that can happen in the uterus, the recommendation would be hysterectomy. Um, ideally, like an open hysterectomy, actually, um, with, during, with an abdominal procedure as opposed to the small little incisions that Dr. Shin was talking about, um, just because of you want to basically get the entire uterus out. You want to minimize any um, spread that can happen out to the upper areas of the abdomen when you're doing laparoscopic surgery. Um, and so that would be the recommendation. Unfortunately, like I said, there is no clear picture. Like we're never going to get a radiologist to say this is 100% lyomyosarcoma. So it ends up being a conversation uh, with our patients about, you know, what we think it is, what our suspicion is, and how we should proceed with the plan. I feel like we see these a lot. <laughs> I feel I've learned a lot from you today, Dr. Cantillo. I always learn a lot from you, Dr. Shin. <laughs> <laughs>